Hello and welcome again to Monster Island Radio. I'm Ben and as always I'm joined by the ever energetic Graham. Hello. <laughs> okay. So today we're talking about Rodan. We're covering his his debut uh, 1956 film today. Um, so unsurprisingly the team behind this are the usual mostly the usual suspects uh we've got uh it's directed by ishiro honda uh visual effects director is eiji tsuburaya uh music by akira ifukube again but this time the story is written by ken kuronuma and then the screenplay is by ken, Kuron- ken kuronuma takeshi kimura and takeo marata so yeah, slightly slightly different setup there, but most of the same people. Um, so let's do a quick mm, quickish summary. Um, <laughs> <laughs> this one's not too bad actually. I've managed to get this one down fairly short. No, yeah. and some things do happen. Yeah, they so do. That's good. That's good. Okay, so two miners, Goro and Yoshi, go missing during a flood in the mines in the village of Kitamatsu at the foothills of Mount Aso. Uh, Yoshi is found dead by engineer Shigeru Kawamura. Due to the cuts Yoshi suffered, the villagers believe Goro had actually killed him and fled the scene, as the two were known for hating each other. Shigeru visits his fiancée, Kyo, to console her as she's shouldering the blame for her brother's her brother Goro's supposed actions. But before long, a large creature appears and bursts through her home. The creature kills two police officers in its rampage and escapes to the mines. Everyone chases the creature, and in the process discover Goro's dead body in the mine. Shigeru uses a minecart to kill the creature, but then another one appears, and as they're shooting it, it causes a cave-in, trapping Shigeru. Paleontologist Dr. Kashiwagi determines that the creature is a Meganulon, an ancient dragonfly larva from 200 million years ago. The police go to investigate the damage from a recent earthquake and discover Shigeru wandering around the epicenter. They bring him into a hospital and find that he's, dis- he's suffering from amnesia. Meanwhile, there are reports from several nations across Asia that there's a supersonic UFO flying around, causing havoc, ruining buildings, killing people and livestock. Kashiwagi suspects that it could be a Tyrannodon, dubbed Rodan, that's responsible. Shigeru's memory is triggered by the sight of bird eggs hatching and recalls seeing Rodan hatching from a colossal egg feasting on the Meganulons. Rodan re-emerges, flies to Fukuoka, and destroys the city. Just as we think things couldn't get worse, a second Rodan appears. Amongst the rubble, a plan is put in place by the military to bomb Mount Aso, where the Rodans have been holding up, to bury them. Kitamatsu is then evacuated for the plan to be put in action, as the attacks could trigger an eruption. The missiles are fired, but it ends up triggering triggering an eruption and also flushes out the Rodans. One of the Rodans suffers an injury in the eruption and collapses in the flames, and the remaining Rodan tries to save the other, but ultimately pays the price in doing so, and dies amongst the flames. So, bye-bye, Rodans. So, yes, that was that. Um, So, (laughs) (laughs) I I sound down on it, but I'm not. Um, So, as you mentioned to me before we started recording, we've got a couple of corrections to make Mm. from our previous uh, episodes. So... Do you want to go first? <laughs> no, you go first. I think yours is more important. Mine's more silly. Okay, right. So yeah, I said during uh, Mothra 1961 episode that it was the first uh, Toho color movie, which was a lie. I was clearly wrong because this one came out in 1956 and it was in color. Mm. So yeah, that's on me. I don't know why I thought that, but yeah, I got it totally wrong. So I- just to ignore that bit. You can kind of see as well, like a lot of early colour movies, when they do the opening titles of this film, it's all like just colours like flashing at you. Yeah, yeah. When all the names and stuff are coming up and it's like, oh yeah, like this is the, this is obviously like, you know, we've got the colour, guys. It's like, yeah. It's psychedelic. Yeah. It's like with 3D movies, everything's coming at the camera kind of thing. Yeah. Yeah. So my correction was in the last episode we did, I joked that we would be revisiting Magic Juice again in Rodan and I don't Mm. know. I must have got my wires crossed about that because I hadn't seen Rodan before, but I had heard or thought I heard that it had um, magic beans or magic juice or whatever <laughs> it is. And this is this is not a magic berry kind of movie. No. So maybe I got my wires crossed and there's, there's more magic berries coming down the, the road, but this was not a magic berry uh, adventure. 
I was sitting Which there. I was kind of waiting for it. I was you know? waiting. I was waiting for the berries, but yeah, right until the very end, I was like, at some point, there's going to be magic <laughs> berries, and they're going to like, you know, stop Rodan using magic berries or something. <laughs> it's going to eat from it a magic berry bush and die. Yeah, it didn't hinder my enjoyment of the movie, though. Yeah, and obviously, it was a refreshing change from magic berries, as it turns out. Yeah, absolutely. Um, but I, have, I quite enjoyed this one. I yeah, I was stepping on the rest of the podcast a little bit, but I absolutely loved this. I mm. really, really enjoyed it. Um, I remember when we were teenagers, you were like quite a Rodan fan of the, you know, fan of the character. It's from the game. From the game. So I'm playing, you know, Godzilla. What's it called? I've got to look at it again. Godzilla destroy your monsters <laughs> melee on the GameCube. You want to play as Rodan because exactly. you're in the air. Yeah. And you can just fire, you know, it's a bit OP. You know, you can just sort of attack everybody who's on the ground and they can't really get you. Mm. And if I'm not mistaken, Mothra is not in that first one. There is a sequel to. Uh, um, she, she's like, um, What's it called? Oh, it's like a, an assist or something, an assist, isn't it? You, yeah, that's the you one. You call her in, you can't control her. Yeah, and then she does little th- beams. Yeah, yeah, there's a Godzilla fighting game on the Wii, which is a sequel, and it's got like way, way more characters than I think you can play as so her in that one. But yeah, that's oh, why nice. I liked Rodan, because I would always play as Rodan in that, and especially in the story mode, you just like wipe through it. Yeah. Um, but I also love the the cry. I think Rodan's like monster roar is probably the best one, yeah, in my opinion. It is a good it's one. really good. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I do like Rodan. So uh, did did the movie live up to your expectations? It's not without its faults, but I think mm. um, it's more to do with age. I mean, the previous episode to this, we did um, uh, Mothra vs. Godzilla. Fun movie, but you know, it was creaky. It lacked some charisma, mm. ultimately. Mm. Uh, and this one, it's a bit uh, older. It's nearly, well, it's, it's like Five eight years, years older. older. No, eight no, years. Right. You're, you're right. Yeah, eight years. Yeah, mm. and um, I mean it's quite impressive. Like with with Godzilla um, fifty four and Mothra and Rodan, I think they are a a uh, notable. Uh, they're notably higher in quality mm-hmm. than the the movies that follow on, where it becomes about like the verses and like contriving like a new reason for like monsters like Godzilla to come back and all of that. And I'd say yeah, this was more in line with Godzilla and Mothra in terms of like feeling like a real movie if you like yes um, and not just like oh we need to you know get a tentpole film out for a bit of money yeah because we see like um Ishiro Honda directs all of these but from his filmography he's just sort of like a job in director at Toho I guess and I'm not sure how I think a lot of the much- staff are yeah, and it's like, I was were these movies, the kaiju movies, made just sort of like out, out of obligation? I'm not really sure about his history. I'd like to look into that more uh, for mm. myself and see like, well, how much did he really enjoy doing these monster sequels? But at least for these, what you could call origin movies, the um, attention to detail is a lot more um, apparent and it is a better made movie in terms of like story, effects, tension, editing. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it was. It did sort of like you know, it's a proper introduction to this character. I don't know how much we'll get out of Rodan in the future installments because I've seen um, the next movie in the Showa series where he turns up along Ghidorah and all that. But um, as far as like what is Rodan's sort of future like in the Showa era of Godzilla, I don't actually know. Yeah. Um, so hopefully it does sort of continue this quality, but remains to be seen for me. Yeah. That's a good point, um, because it did make me question, like when you say about like Godzilla 1954, Mothra's original movie, and this one, it made me think, well, these are always like very good compared to the rest. And I was like, does that mean I'm not so big on the other ones, like the Versus movies and stuff like that? And it really made me question what it is I actually enjoy about these, which mm. I found quite quite strange, actually. Um, but I don't think that's true. I don't think, because I mean, I still love... Um, giant monsters all out attack you know one of the millennium movies yeah that's you know that's a big versus movie and that's still you know one of my absolute faves so i don't think it's um means i'm not a fan of those kinds of movies no uh, it's not a broad they, thing as such. no no but yeah. yeah you're right there's a there's a notable quality uh a difference in quality between yeah the original movies and then what, what comes after i think especially in the show era yeah, on paper, I want the versus movie, but in practice, from the show era specifically, yeah, the individual ones have been stronger. Mm. Um, I think it's a, it, yeah, I mean, we could get dig into this topic of like which ones are better as individuals, which ones are better as versus, you know, but they're often very different kinds of things of a different vibe. And naturally, any movie with like versus in the title becomes more 
popcorn-y. I guess you see this all the way through, actually. Like, the 2014 Godzilla, obviously, they hadn't really found their footing with what they wanted to do with MonsterVerse, but they go quite serious yes. with that. Yeah. And then by the time you get to um, Godzilla vs. Kong, it's like a completely different kind of action movie. So the same pattern is sort of there, regardless of whether or not the solo outing is successful or not. By the time you get to the head-to-head movie, it's it's more kind of like silly just by nature. Yeah, I, I suppose you kind of have to start out quite serious, I think, in order for people to take the characters seriously. I guess you so. You know, to really yeah. kind of get behind the, the character or the monster or whatever. I would still take what they were trying to do with Gareth Edwards' 2014 movie just done better. I think it's a good attempt. And I don't mind a serious Godzilla at all because obviously we talk about 54 and blah, blah, blah. Mm-hmm. But yeah, I just I think it's too po-faced. I think we, yeah. we, we covered yeah. this in the episode. It doesn't have enough fun. Yeah. And it, it, it detracts away from action too much and all of that. But you know, all I'm saying is like, it's not universal that the solo movie is better. It's just that we are kind of, kind of picking up on the tonal differences that is implied um because the versus movies are just by nature like that's what you're gunning towards regardless of what the story is it's always just about that and that's often what they trip over or what mm. we kind of get impatient about so mm. yeah it's just something that's becoming more apparent i guess yeah um so yeah this movie is a bit of a uh, a bit of a fusion genre movie i thought because it starts out as kind of like a murder mystery with like you know yoshi getting killed and then Gora's disappeared and there's, you know, it causes some upheaval in the town and, um, you know, because Goro is wrongly accused and all that stuff. And then it kind of takes a, a sharp turn into like a sci-fi horror movie when um, the Mega Nulon appears in, <laughs> in, her, hou- in her house, mm. in Keo's house. Um, kind of like, you know, kind of like the blob kind of thing, you know, that kind of 50s sci-fi horror thing. That actually startled me when the, <laughs> when the Mega Nulon <laughs> showed up. <laughs> I liked the Mega Nulon in this movie, but I still didn't like the sound they were making it. To me, it wasn't like menacing enough. It was just sort of like they make this sort of squeaky sort of sound. And it doesn't really, I mean, to me, I don't know what you think from like a sound design point of view, but it doesn't really feel like they're making that sound. It's just like that is the sound that the movie wants to associate with their presence. Absolutely. I think maybe it was so it could differentiate it from Rodan probably. And it's like, we'll have something that sounds a bit more kind of, um, I suppose it sounds synthetic, but... That kind of cosmic-y, sci-fi, sort of lasery sound, whatever the hell it is. It's, I guess you know, so. It's, it's so distinct. But I, I completely agree with what you're saying because it's like, yeah, it just feels like, oh, they've played that sound. This means there's a Mega Nulon about. Yeah. 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 <laughs> but yeah. Um, but yeah, their their appearance, like, it reminded me of how, like, the only bits of uh, Godzilla versus Mega Gears that we praised with those kind of street level moments with the mega nulons That's yeah like, i couldn't go, help but think get... back to that but also yeah. how that i wanted it to be more horror um you it know, with... yeah it could have had some more actually mm. um yeah and then well and then it turned into the kaiju tokusatsu kind of kind of movie i mean um, yeah the structure of this is quite interesting actually because the start of the movie like you say we've been kind of like a, you could look at it as a mixture of genres but the first half hour is very much dedicated to the Megalonulon and like what's happening with the miners. Somebody's dead. We reveal the Megalonulon and that's the problem. And then eventually we just take a big break from the Megalonulon and it starts being about Rodan. And then, and until Rodan appears, we don't go back to the Megalonulon again. And it's like almost like the first two 30 minutes is like, you know, two different things and it doesn't kind of overlap and they don't edit them together. And the way that they, it sort of it builds up to this thing that like, oh, you think the Mega Nulon are the menace of the movie, but ultimately they turn out to, to merely be the food of this bigger creature. Mm-hmm. So you can't mm-hmm. really intermingle them as stories. But when you're watching it, it's very odd that you sit through what is effectively one episode and then the second episode within the movie doesn't really talk about Mega Nulon that much. It's interesting because I that's what I liked about it. Mm, I thought well, that I thought that worked in its favour because I really I mean, that's exactly what I thought as well. It's like, oh, you think these are the threat. These mega nulons are the, the the scary thing. Oh, and there's oh, there's more than one of them. Oh my god! And mm. then it turns out to be food for an even bigger threat. I was like, oh, like that'd be so great. I think not knowing what's going on going in. I mean, the trouble is with this era of mm. uh, movie making and advertising is you know you've got posters that say Rodan the flying creep, whatever you know the flying they, monster, yeah. the flying monster. And like you got a picture of it, and you're like going in, you'd know. And like especially trailers back then, they basically show you the whole movie. 
Yeah. So it's like you would never go in and be surprised by anything that's happened, which is really bizarre. And I don't like that about, I mean, they do it in trailers now, but um, mm. I would love to watch this not knowing what the hell is going to happen. Cause I imagine that works, that flow works really well. So yeah, you do kind of forget about the mega Nulons after that point. Um, but it's because something, something more pressing has, uh, has reared his head. Yeah. So, I think it's hard to put yourself in the minds of somebody, uh, in the mindset of somebody who doesn't know what's going to happen there. Well, but I think because they do sort of bench the Mega Nulon to such a degree, it's hard not to predict yourself that they're no longer going to be what's, you know, the problem because they go from being the focal point of the movie and then there's like a baby, like a 20 minute chunk where they don't really feature at all. So it feels like they need to keep the Mega Nulon threat going as they start to talk about Rodan and they could have maybe. Um, built upon the murder mystery story a bit more, maybe like a couple more people people in the town get off or something, and it's like, oh well, it's the Mega Nulon, but we haven't quite like got to that point, so it's just sort of just overlap it a little bit, so it doesn't feel like they're quite so absent. Yeah, because they they could have been like, oh, we need to evacuate the town because the Mega Nulons are still rampaging, kind of. Yeah, thing. they could have done yeah. something like that, and it's like we want to keep the idea that the Mega Nulons are the problem. But they just sort of leave it entirely while they then go to talk about Rodan. And the Rodan stuff is interesting because this is a movie which really they put a lot of effort into explaining the presence of the creature. You know, it's it's farcical, but they they do, you know, cover it quite in detail. Mm. Um but yeah, it's just a shame that they do sort of we're gonna leave the Mega Nulon and then they don't come back to them until they're sort of saying, Well, now they're not an issue anymore because it that turns out they're just Rodan's meal. Um, so just a little bit of over- overlapping would have just helped that transition feel like, oh, like the Mega Nulon are a menace and we really don't like them. And then suddenly, sort of thing, um, Rodan it appears because it's almost like Rodan appears through being explained before he appears on screen sort of thing. Um, through the way the film's structured, at least to me, that's how I felt. I felt like, oh, now we're into like, we're talking about, you know, flying dinosaurs and stuff like that. Um you can feel it's it's coming before we even get to it, so they could have maybe concealed it a little bit um, more, perhaps. But yeah, it was how they tried to kind of explain what was going on with Rodan before you saw him. It was kind of I feel like they were trying to build up a whole UFO mm. kind of vibe to it first. They were like, "Oh, we don't know what it could be. It could be a UFO. This thing from space." Even though the movie's called Flying Monster, but it could be a UFO. Yeah, so that's the, that's exactly what I mean. It's like. That sort of stuff just like it removes any of that mystery. So yeah, not knowing that would be would be great. But yeah, they did that sort of yeah. Maybe it's a UFO, maybe it's aliens kind of thing. And mm. I quite like. I really like that actually. Um, yeah, and I, I thought that worked really well. And then you yeah you start to see glimpses of it, and you're like, well, that doesn't quite look like a UFO. And then you see photos, and then they figure out what it could be. And I I liked that build up. I thought that I thought that was good. Um, but yeah, I like the story idea. I like this idea of you know, prehistoric dinosaurs waking up in a modern town, basically, and like yeah. their in- instincts kick in. They're roaming around looking for food and terrorize hapless humans. You know, um, mm. I thought that was yeah, I thought that was good. I mean, it's uh, I suppose it's a foundation for stuff like Billy and the Clonosaurus. <laughs> you know, so uh, yeah, I I thought that was great. I I really enjoyed the story, and it actually employed some of the kind of. Um, narrative structures that you pointed out in godzilla 1954 Hmm. with the like the flashback and stuff like that of like you know when um when he gets his memory back yeah when he gets his memory back you're like oh what was it he saw because i really i really love the idea of him losing his memory not because of the cave-in but because he saw something so terrifying it's Mm -hmm. like it just wiped his memory um i thought that was really cool so yeah seeing that flashback seeing what it was and seeing this huge thing eating the thing that was terrorizing the towns i thought was a was a very cool reveal um but actually no i do see what you're saying now actually because you do kind of get the idea of rodan before you see him come from the egg don't you because yeah you do see him flying at one point yeah i think i get what you mean actually yeah i think i get what you mean they could just tweak it a little bit to make it feel like there was more than one threat at once i guess is how i would put it because mm. it feels like we deal with one threat and that threat of the Mega Nulon is very much still ongoing, but the movie just sort of forgets about it, where it's like we could just overlap it a bit, just a little bit more. So it's like, oh, you know. Um, you could even do a shot where like somebody was being attacked by Mega Nulon and then Rodan like 
flies over and, and they're like, oh, what? <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> Something like that. <laughs> um, but I think this is to do with age of the movie. And I think if we were seeing this same film made now, and obviously we have seen other kaiju things made, this sort of... Rodan is all about the build-up to Rodan's appearance, Rodan's existence being explained, and then Rodan being dealt with. But that explanation and the reveal takes up most of the movie. And today, that would just be the first half hour. And then we'd have another series of events. Back in the 50s, this was enough to fill a film and you'd be quite satisfied with it. And yeah. for its era, it is actually a really good movie. Um, yeah. It's just, you know, you see its age and that, like, we're spending a lot of time on these little details. And, you know, as satisfying as they may be, it just feels like they could have done more. And I don't know that, you know, people would have really felt like that back in the 1950s or we just feel that way from, you know, this looking back on it yeah actually because it does have some yeah those kind of similarities with things like well mothra for example where most of the interesting stuff is reserved for the last part Mm. um but i don't know i i feel like i think pacing wise this is probably the best example of probably all the ones we've seen out of this show era for me um because because of that build-up, the way it ups the ante each time with each thing. Like, you think, oh, it's one Mega Nulon, then there's multiple, then there's Rodan, and then, oh shit, there's two Rodans. Um, and I, I felt like the the pacing for each of those things just kind of, you know, hooked me the whole way through. And, like, it wasn't particularly character-focused. And I mean that in the best best way possible, you know. What we have, character-wise, you know, pushes the narrative and the mystery forward without becoming tiresome or uninteresting. Um and like just keep you know those reveals kind of keep coming um so i think pacing wise this was like this was bang on for me but i don't know is that how you feel or not um it's i think it's not so much about pacing is what i mean it's more that if this were a modern movie they would i mean just by virtue of the kaiju genre progressing at this point in the early um part of the genre you know it's only a couple of years since godzilla came out they would know that audiences will need to see a bit extra. The whole idea of the monster being revealed and then being dealt with um, it wouldn't be enough. And we just see that as movies, you know, as movies become more modern, the more recent films just have more going on, you know, um, where they deal with more than one monster or there's, you know, just just events. Oh, I see. So basically more about. threads going on at once kind of thing. Yeah, I feel mm. like they could have maybe... I mean, not that they should change Rodan, because I think Rodan's a fine movie, but if it were modern, I think that they would get to Rodan a bit quicker and we would see more kind of going on once he was, you know, a present threat rather than it just being like, it's pretty much once Rodan is out in the open, he has a bit of an action sequence in the one city and then they kind of get rid of him. And a lot of the action is, yeah, reserved for the end. Whereas even in, in Godzilla, there's a lot more like narrative around oh this thing exists we need to get rid of this thing and the movie is kind of about solving the problem and the problem While the solving, terror is going on yeah it takes up the like, more of the movie whereas in rodan it's more about building to the problem and then the problem actually takes up less of the movie as a result I so get you. they're different yeah but um yeah it's just that you know older movies just have less things happening in them in general mm. not always the case you know something like wizard of oz loads of things happen in it and it's way older than this movie But you see what I mean is that, you know, as the monster movie genre progresses, we expect more. And I just feel that absence in this one in a way that I probably didn't so much in Godzilla and Mothra. Oh, right. Okay. But I I still enjoyed it just as much. And it was just a bit different Um, Mm. because, you know, they get the Mega Mulons in there and, you know, um, they they haven't um want like I say once once it's revealed that Rodan eats Mega Mulons, I guess we're just left to presume that, well, he's eaten all of them. (laughs) <laughs> you know, and they're gone. They never really resurface in the film. Um, not that they should necessarily, but it just feels like, well, the movie kind of does deal with one thing at a time. Um, and it's very enjoyable. I don't want to be down on it at all. It's just that that's where you see the creakiness of like, well, if this was a modern film, um, it would feel a bit more multifaceted. After I watched it, I put on just that Rodan part from the recent King of the Monsters movie. Yeah. Just to see, like, well, what happened to Rodan? Like, you know, what's the modern one? Um, and it just reminds me, like, well, that movie, King of the Monsters, for all of its flaws that we talked about in our first episode, is very multifaceted and lots of things are going on at once. Yeah. Um, so that's you know, how, you, how I would compare them from being, like, 70 years apart, basically. That Rodan part of King of the Monsters is easily the best chunk of the movie. Absolutely, yeah. I think when we first watched it, I was so 
um, invested in the film and then when the climax comes and I think it's pretty disappointing the climax of the movie that left me on like a sour note and that's apparent in our episode mm. but, but anything in that film from when Rodan comes out of the volcano to when Ghidorah lands back on top of the volcano which is just one of the chapters on the Blu-ray which you can just watch in isolation yeah that's like that's the best part of the film yeah um, so like I think yeah I don't know what, what Rodan's going to be doing in the future show of movies but it's just a good character, like big pterodactyl, like let's have it sort of thing. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, that's what I mean about this. With the older movie, the 56 Rodan movie, you just feel a kind of, not an emptiness at all, but things are left to breathe in a way that through just media literacy or progression of a genre, we don't need as much time spent on these things now. Mm. And that's the only real detractor of the film is that, yeah, it's like 70 years old and it feels like it. Um, but other than that, I really enjoyed it. I think uh, it probably plays in its favour to me because, like, I I think I've said to you before, like, for some reason when I'm watching a movie, when I first watch it, I don't take all of it in, mm. um, especially when there's a lot of stuff going on because I, I find myself focusing on maybe maybe the wrong parts of a movie. Um, so it's not until the second viewing where I really fully get what's going on. Uh, maybe I'm just dumb. But, uh, <laughs> I, think so. I think some <laughs> films are designed that way, aren't they? There's the multiple layers. Yeah, probably. Let's say that. Um, certainly new movies are like that, especially like, you know, since the advent of home media and stuff like that, it's all very yeah. different. Yeah. Um, but um, yeah, older so, movies are a bit more simple, aren't they? Yeah, absolutely. So like for me watching this, I was like, I, you know, even though I did watch it a few times uh, after the first time, you know, I totally got it. And I, th- I suppose there's a bit of pressure because when we're doing one of these episodes, I want to make sure I don't miss anything. Mm-hmm. But um, so that's what I end up watching things several times but with this. Yeah, it all kind of like all clicked into place. Absolutely fine for me. So I felt quite satisfied watching it. And I think maybe because we're doing this might be the reason. <laughs> um, but yeah, it's uh, no, it was uh, I, I, I loved it. I loved it. Yeah, it had a bit more of a serious tone again, I suppose, like the other original movies. Well, Mothra wasn't that serious, but um, obviously Godzilla 54 was. They kind of touched on the whole um, hydrogen bomb testing as to why, um, you know, Mega Nulons and uh, Rodan um, were like, exist, re- reborn. Yeah. yeah. And they kind of hinted at global warming at one point, And I thought that was what they were. I thought that was going to be the, the driving point for um, the reason the you know, they all came back. And I was and it really made me think, like, if they do ever do a reboot i think that would be great a great thing to revisit um mm. like having this idea of you know the global temperatures heating up these eggs basically to have you know incubating the eggs in the water <laughs> kind of thing i was like that would be a, you know because a lot of these films you know they kind of have a point to them you know obviously godzilla it's the atomic bomb blah 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 so like having that idea of like oh well climate change bringing back rodan that'd be a great movie i think and also, I really liked the. They only touched on it a little bit, but there was the um, their plan to um, kill the Rodans was you know bombing that um, that mountain, mm. that volcano, and this idea of like, well, you know, if it causes an eruption, you know, it could you know d- you know there's like destruction of nature to stop further loss. But I thought it was quite an interesting conflict. Um, you know, it's like, oh, should we go ahead with doing this? It's like, well, we don't really have much choice. I really liked that conflict there. Um, yeah. I didn't really dwell on it that much, but I really liked the, the kernels of these ideas in there. I thought were really good. Um, and yeah, and I would li- I'd like to see that explored again. I don't think we, like you're saying, don't know how Rodan really pans out throughout the rest of the era, so we probably won't touch on any of these themes ever again. But um, <laughs> <laughs> I really like them in this. So. From what I can see, Rodan, as a movie, did not make that much money. Um, wasn't successful. Uh, in the same way Godzilla was. Yeah, it was successful in, in the US. Mm, it had but, like quite a huge marketing campaign. But maybe that explains why we didn't get like Rodan 2, 3, 4, the same way you got like Godzilla and so on. Mm. It doesn't feel like there is as much of a kind of dramatic kind of point to it in the same way Godzilla has as well. Yeah, it's like if- it, it means something when like this creature appears. And, and I do like Rodan's death, which is like, oh, we have to kill them and that kind of quandary is definitely there like you say and the characters have to well not have to but they i suppose they end up in a situation where they are watching both of the rodan monsters be killed and they don't enjoy it they they seem distressed by the the whole thing Mm. and there's obviously like something in that about like you know killing creatures but it's not as at the forefront of the of the movie as the godzilla being you know an allegory is in those films 
Yeah, that's why I wish they touched on it with the the global warming mm. thing, and then I think that could still carry on being Rodan's thing, you know, in the same way a top, you know, nuclear is Godzilla's thing. Um, yeah, but hey ho, probably never going to happen. Um, <laughs> it's, yeah, I mean, they were happy to do the Rodan sort of cameo in King of the Monsters, but I don't know that they're ever going to make title kaiju movies other than Kong and Godzilla in the modern era i don't think they will either like i think at a stretch you might get another mothra one in japan mm. um and maybe that would be it or maybe a tv show out of push but yeah it feels like now it's boiled down to you know these are the main characters everyone else is tertiary kind of thing mm. um okay the characters who do we have in this we i only really mentioned three here in, in my notes because there's really only three worth kind of talking about i suppose you had um shigeru kawamura played by kenji sahara so that was in our last episode mothra versus godzilla that was the um Torahata, the cigar smoking bad guy mm. yeah that's him um so he's a the mining engineer um i look quite liked his character he was level-headed you know he's rational he's quite caring um and I think his his level headedness kind of played into the, you know, it, le- it kind of lent credence to the idea of what he saw, you know, because he seemed so so rational, level level headed that him losing his memory for something so terrifying kind of adds to that. Oh my god, what the hell did this guy see? You know, because yeah. he, he doesn't seem like a bullshitter. Exactly. Yeah, it felt like that had some credence to it, and you were like, well, when's his memory going to come back? Is it going to come back? Yeah. Sort of thing. Yeah. And it had some good foreshadowing as well. I think when he looked at the eggs and that's when he got his memory back but there were two eggs in that little nest oh yeah i thought that was quite a nice little touch true um, true. but yeah i only spotted that on my second time viewing i didn't think about that at all but yeah that, i think that may be like a little clue yeah i think so um but yeah i thought he was you know well acted good character i mean not like it's particularly stand out but you know perfect perfectly fine for this movie perfect tone and then you had Kyo, who was played by Yumi Shirakawa. I thought she was a good actor. Um, this was her first film role. Mm. And apparently she's referred to as the Grace Kelly of Japan. Which well, did I, she marry some famous prince or something? Or? I have no idea. Mm. But, uh, I mean, she basically cried in every scene. That was that was her job. Designated yeah. emotion person. I still liked her, though. I no well i I didn't dislike (laughs) as much but uh, what i I would do to improve it perhaps is just make her give her a bit more agency in proving her brother is not a murderer you know crying a lot about you know the deaths and stuff and their boyfriend losing his memory that's all perfectly fine and of its time but they could have just had a couple of little moments where she was a bit more forceful of us like my brother is not a murderer sort of thing yeah she's she's definitely a kind of pawn to say like oh by the way everyone else around her is horrible they're all accusing yeah Goro, you know and you can tell you can tell everyone else is horrible because she's crying yeah and yeah. she just sort of is there crying and her her actual opinion about it is never really explained like does she think her brother's capable of that yeah she doesn't really say it. the only person that does explain it is um is shigeru yeah. he's like well goro wouldn't do that and she's like are you sure well she doesn't say that but you know it's kind of she could say that though couldn't she that's the thing is like they could yeah. have like a real like everybody's blaming you for your brother's murder i don't think he is a murderer and she's like well actually i don't I don't know if he's innocent or mm. not. And, you know, there could be interesting, like, yeah, they could have done a bit more with that. But again, that's that's the age thing, isn't it? So she's, she's a very good actress from what we saw. The yeah. movie's lacking a bit of humour as well. Like a lot of the scenes, not that you need humour in every single movie, but there's no moment where, like, it just sort of relaxes. Between mm. um, Shigeru and her, it's all very emotional. And there's no moment of just, like, breaking that tension a little bit at any point in the movie. So it's very sort of highly strung weirdly i i liked that i uh, really enjoyed that like there, you're right there was no kind of no comedy i suppose i thought it was going to be a bit more humorous at the beginning like when yoshi and goro were fighting mm. and like just as they're about to stop one of the other like flicked the other one's shirt yeah. and something came off it i was like oh, it was a pretty funny fight um <laughs> and then uh and then like there was there was no laughs after that point not a single laugh but i i liked that even though it was it, I would. I wouldn't even say it was dour. I think it was emotional, mm. um, and quite quite heartfelt. Uh, and that weirdly, you know, me and I, how I hate forced romances and all that kind of crap. Yeah. Um, all of that I thought worked really, really well. 
Um, so, like, the only thing that I thought was a bit confusing was that was Shigeru and Kyo's relationship, because I thought, uh, you know, for she's the brother of Goro, he's Goro's friend, and they kind of came together through mm-hmm. his death, kind of thing. And that that's how I interpreted it on my first watch. I was like, oh, that's you know, I thought that was really sweet. Like when they were being evacuated and Kyo went to go uh, see Shigeru, I was like, oh, she, you know, she didn't bother going with everyone else. She went to go see him, and that way that music played there. I thought it was really, really sweet. Um, and I was like, oh, this is nice to see this kind of like subtle romance kind of blooming. Um, but then I after that, I was looking up the wiki page just to make sure I got all my ducks in a row, kind of thing. And uh, it said that they were they were engaged to be wed. I was mm. like, really? Like, I didn't pick up on that. So apparently, I missed the subtleties of um, engaged people. Like, they did not seem engaged to me at all. I mean, this could be a cultural thing. Probably that's what it is. But mm. in any case, I, I, I did like what I was seeing on screen. Um, but I would never have pegged them as a engaged to be wed couple. I got that they were a couple when Shigeru turned up at her house and I guess... Oh, like, held her hand kind of thing. Yeah, it was, oh, well, they're actually a couple. And the, the prior scenes that where they're talking, I'm just assuming this goes back to what we've cited many times, that public display of affection in Japan is kind of not a thing, I guess, especially in the 1950s and all that. Mm. So I think it's just that their relationship is subtle. And like you said, it's just through culture. Yeah. Um, and maybe there is some things that are just a little bit lost in translation there where you just sort of pick up on it. I definitely thought, oh, they're boyfriend and girlfriend. I didn't realise they were actually engaged, but mm. it doesn't well, really play a huge part of the story other than that, like, they are sort of connected. Like, when they when he loses his memory, they bring her to try and, like, jog his mind a bit and it doesn't work. And so they're, they're sort of using their romance in that way. But otherwise, like, it's not a forced romance, is it? It's not really, no. like, impeding or imposing itself on the film to kind of, like, tick a box. It just sort of is there. And the subtlety of it, like, is, is beneficial in that regard. Absolutely, yeah. I think anything that is there it does add to what's going on, adds to some of the drama and some of the emotion. I wonder if it's because, like, I, I'm skeptical that they were engaged, to be honest, because at no point throughout the Japanese subbed version is there any mention of them even being a couple, let alone mm. engaged. There's n- literally no mention of it. Does she have, like, um, a ring on her finger or something? Like, not, they... not that I saw. Maybe she did, actually. I didn't. So maybe take this with a pinch of salt, but there was no mention of it. Um, but in the American cut slash dub right. um they make it clear like yes we're together we're, oh, you know, so they might have just like pushed it along and then it's just been and yeah now through assumed, osmosis yeah. it's like yeah okay they were obviously a fiance, uh, sorry not, uh, engaged to be married um so yeah i don't i don't think they necessarily were but yeah I, they were a couple obviously so yeah. whether they're engaged or not i mean it's whatever um but yeah i i i like i like them mm. i thought they were lovely characters um yeah, it, it hit all the right marks for me. Um, and there was another character, uh, Dr. Kashiwagi, who's played by Akihiko Hirata. So he's a paleontologist who's there to explain everything that we're seeing. Uh, yeah, he's fine. <laughs> he's <laughs> I, an I, exposition machine. Exposition um, machine, yeah, and exactly. The, act, the acting is actually quite good. For, you know, when, you know, when actors get roles like this, it must be quite difficult. Like All you've got to do is you know it, you're holding it's the scaffolding of the story and you yeah. just get to describe things like you know s- jargon about kaijus and stuff it's not very meaty acting stuff to do but they do mm. a good job making it feel earnest and believable so it's cool yeah um and that was kind of it really i mean there are others but none yeah. of those really made that much of an impact on the story it's like a good this- example of when a film like it doesn't have any human villain there's no like businessman trying to mess things True. up or anything like that yeah um it's just all about the monsters and the people who are affected by those monsters which is really the the perfect you know line to walk when it comes to the human drama of the kaiju movie absolutely um the perfect balance of everything there for me mm. um i found that final scene of the dying rodans really like I found that quite moving. Like I thought that was so sad, and the music they were playing there was it was yeah, very emotive. Um, yeah. You know, I, I love to indulge in a bit of melancholy, mm. so this kind of hit the mark for me. Um, and like like I was saying, it's um, Ifukube did the soundtrack, and obviously when you think of him, you think of like you know big lumbering, booming brass and stuff like that. But I think he showed his hand at something a bit more delicate and heartfelt. And I like the parallels in tone between. Um, 
those moments between Kia and Shigeru and that final scene with the Rodan trying to save the other one, they had that similar kind of tone uh, to the, the music there, um, which felt intentional. It might not have been, but I, I heard some parallels there, which I thought were quite, quite nice. Um, and you also got some ominous, you know, spooky music as well, especially when they're like preparing the missiles and stuff like that, you know? So I, I, I think uh, he was showing his, his strengths mm. on all fronts there throughout this. Uh, there's some similarities between some of the Godzilla music and this, but I mean, I think that's inherent with this style of music, really. Yeah, I, I felt um, the melancholy and the death scene at the end as well. I think I probably would have been more emotionally affected if the effects were a little bit better because they are sort of like a bit sort of, um, you know, it's just props sort of being dropped down to, to c- catch fire and all of that. Mm. Um, so if it looked a little bit, um, more impressive I might have been more affected by it because it's kind of obvious like oh these are just like you know it's, the special effects are a little bit aged there but as an idea it is very um, kind of unpleasant and sort of uh, yeah it's unpleasant to look at I suppose yeah and you feel like well these creatures are sort of, sort of being killed off and much like you know Godzilla and a lot of other Godzilla movies it's like is the creature deserving of this like mm. not really yeah um, but they have to get rid of it yeah um, I think I was I was all in on this film like i'm finding it hard to to pick faults like even even with these special effects like the for example the city the city destruction scene mm-hmm. was the best bit of the movie there was um, a, those miniatures were very strong especially man, compared to the previous so movie we've just good. watched yeah 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 unbelievably good um my partner was watching a bit of it with me before she went out and um she was like oh wow these miniatures are great mm. like just you know it was just it, that that good. Um, and like you can see people running around. I don't know how they did it, to be honest. They can see people running around inside the miniatures. There's probably some sort of composition there. I don't know how they well, did maybe it. Maybe they're just like rear screen projection. Could, so could like, be that, that actually. Is in there actually being projected yeah. in real time or something like that. It could yeah, be compositing either. I don't some, know, actually. Yeah. Mm, yeah, I, I couldn't quite tell. I watched it a couple of times. I was like, how did they actually do that? I don't know. So it could be any any number of those things. I don't know. For the era, it feels likely that it's it's a live projection. Mm, yeah. Um, but possibly compositing. Don't know. Not sure. But really good. They do a bit of compositing during the cockpit shots where the pilots are flying around near Rodan. And a bit where Rodan, where you see inside one of the buildings when Rodan hits it, I think. Yeah, so it yeah. definitely could be either or. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I think special effects wise, bloody good. I really, I thought they were great, even though, well, I thought they were convincing, even though there was some parts that were not convincing at all, like the piano strings holding up Rodan. (laughs) It seemed to me like there was absolutely no effort to conceal that whatsoever, but it didn't matter. It bothered you so much. Not even, not even a little bit. I was like, yeah, so, like, I I did not care. And like, there were even shots when uh, the planes were flying across and you see the, the camera pan across and you see the corner of the room, like the seam, oh, and really? the paneling of the room. Yeah, and then it pans back like, a, oops, when's I supposed to get that? And even with that kind of stuff, I was like, yeah, whatever. It 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 didn't matter because I was just I felt so invested in this the whole way through. Like none of that mattered. So like, yeah, that ending scene with the two Rodans, yeah, kind of looks a bit ropey. It's like puppets flapping about. But man, I was all in. Mm. And I think Rodan's sense of scale actually was probably the best we've seen in any of these. Um, like when he's... suit moments because I think because I think it's in part to his his design because he's le- he looks less like a guy in a suit so mm. your sense of scale isn't influenced by that comparison so you can kind of suspend your disbelief and be like well, what is this thing it's huge look at those buildings they're small this thing must be massive you know when Rodan first hatches from the egg and it, it, it eats some of the mega nulon mm. the scale is it's a bit out of absolutely incredible like it's like <laughs> this baby rodan is like so big in concept of like the mega Nulon, like these tiny little maggots that he's eating <laughs> and the mega Nulon is about the size of like three or four people yeah yeah and then later in the movie when we see the fully grown rodan attacking the city it's like it's not really that big it's not um, that big so it's sort of up and down a little it bit is. and especially but, actually at yeah, that scene where you see the egg hatching you mm-hmm. can see um shigeru near the egg and he's like maybe half the size of the egg 
I, I can't really tell. Is he supposed to be like looking like far on, away? Uh, yeah, like how close is he supposed to be? So I just sort of accepted, like, well, he's sort of far away from it, I guess. But yeah, yeah it, it sort of um, the scale fluctuates from scene to scene. Because then it I does. guess if, if then if you compare the planes flying alongside Rodan, Rodan would be smaller still than even he is in the city. I think. Mm, yeah. True. Um, so I got a query about the Rodans though. Okay. Because we see we get like. Um, the 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 UFO um, sort of reports about the Rodan. That's that's it's like it's almost like we see those happening in the story. Yep. Then we get uh, at a certain point a flashback from Shigeru getting his memory back that shows the Rodan hatching, mm-hmm. and then it's revealed that there are actually two Rodans. Mm-hmm. So the one that hatches is not the one from the UFO reports. That one was already flying around, or have I got that mixed up? Or maybe doesn't so matter. So the one that hatched is the one that was flying around. Right. Well, I mean, it could... could well, be either. It, it could be either. It could be either. Yeah, because the flashback really born, was... I guess. Because when, yeah, when that cave-in happened, Rodan hadn't been flying around at that point. Mm. And it was just after after the cave-in, that's when Rodan started flying around. So okay. Rodan had hatched, um, but I guess grew up pretty quickly. But yeah, it could have been the, could have been the other one. Is it supposed to be that there's two because like the mother is coming to get the egg? Is that that sort of story, or is it just like oh, there's two and we don't really know where the other one came from? I think it's two. We don't know where the other one came from because what uh, I the way I rationalised it in my head was there were two eggs in that cave, but uh, because of his memory, he only yeah, really he remembers, remembers seeing one. Egg. Yeah, and because that when they went to go back and see the egg site, it had all caved in and crushed all the egg, and so they, they only found one bit of shell. Yeah, yeah mm-hmm. so you couldn't really tell. So that's that's how I yeah played it in my head um or the egg was just on the other side of the mountain or something i don't know um mm. but yeah they did kind of like i said there was the foreshadowing with the the two eggs in the nest but then there was also i don't know if it's foreshadowing or just pointing out that there is more than one but in those news broadcasts um when it cuts to one of the countries i can't remember which one they're saying like oh well we've had uh, an attack in manila and, and then mm. another one in beijing like only 20 minutes apart this is impossible there must be two and i was like i thought that was implying that rodan's so fast mm, i thought that's, so as well yeah. yeah so maybe that's what they were doing saying like oh you know you're just getting a sense of his speed but then it's actually it ends up being two so maybe it's up to you to decide yeah. the logic of that <laughs> yeah yeah i i guess it's not that important but um again i think it's part of the mystery really you know of what, what the fuck's going on Feels like um, they may have invented a reason for there to be two, so they could have an ending that felt like, oh, one tries to save the other, and yeah, probably. Know. But yeah, it's fine. Yeah, it's, it's a nice sort of surprise because, like you say, the Meganulon not being the threat is spoiled by the advertising of the movie because we know it's called Rodan and Rodan's on the posters. Yeah, there's only one. There's only one Rodan. Oh, yeah. So maybe, maybe they thought, oh, we can like sort of you know have a little surprise there by having uh, one, yeah. two or something like that, you know. Because uh, it was a surprise, I'll be honest. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was, I was surprised. So when the second one turned up, I was like, "Oh, here we go." Almost fell out my chair. Yeah. <laughs> um. So yeah, there was a US cut of this. Oh yeah, go I realised actually in our last recording that uh, I was going to talk about Mothra versus the Thing, but I never mm. actually did. No. Um. I'm not going to talk about it now. I mean, whatever. Really. I got the uh, impression there was not much to say about there it. Anyway. Are, yeah. There were a couple of things to say, but it's not important okay. at all. So forget it. But uh, so I won't dwell on this too long. But yeah, there's there's another version. So the US version, um, it's ten minutes shorter. Oh yeah. Um, but the biggest difference is the unrelenting voiceover, like in Gigantis. Oh, I see. Yeah. So this was so it's George Takei again. Oh um, right. Yeah. So this was actually his first acting role. Oh. Yeah, and then after that he did. Um, Godzilla raids again. The same thing again. The, the exact same thing. So he's like voicing pretty much all the roles, um, and yeah, it's it's like an audio book. It's just it's constant. It's almost unwatchable in my opinion. Is it like you see Rodan burning and he's like, I am seeing yes. Rodan burning. Yep, yep, yep. yep. Right. Every thought is explained. Everything that's happening is explained. It's uh, I found it difficult to watch actually. Um, uh yeah uh i'd say that's the biggest difference they also use some like stock footage and the intro of like the hyd- like real hydrogen bomb tests which mm. i thought was quite uh i thought that was quite good actually it was um mm. i guess you could play around like should we do it be doing that but like 
Well, yeah, I they've like they've done this. it so many times, haven't they? It's like okay. I, I felt like the message that was coming across in the American mm. cut was like, oh yeah, we did a bad thing, by the way. So I I like that yeah, aspect. Yeah. yeah. Um, and there was also a lot of stock music that replaced the score. Yeah. Uh, Is which, that maybe because they just had to replace so much of the sound? They just I, had to. That's that was my assumption, but yeah. whether that's true or not, I don't know. That could be it. I mean, it seems logical, right? Yeah. Mm, yeah. So I don't know. It's um, it wasn't as good. It sounds very westernized. I sound like such a weeb. I know, but like it, it just wasn't as good. Yeah, it didn't well, really fit the movie. We have said though that King Kong versus Godzilla is much better than the American. Yes. Uh, yeah. So, so you know, we're it, not it, like it just depends. Totally, it's totally yeah. case by case, and in most cases they're not better because they they remove things that don't need to be removed or they treat you a bit more stupid yes i think they're assuming in the american sense that you're going to like a matinee screening of like probably two or three movies and you're not really paying attention you're chatting to your friends you're having Mm. a snog with your girlfriend you know you're in and out to the toilet and they put the voice over there because they know like this is not a movie they're expecting to make much money on because nobody's really going specifically to see it as much as they would maybe a a an American movie in an American cinema, mm. but it's overbearing. It becomes very irritating, and you know, it does. Yeah. yeah. Speaking of the sound, though, the thing that I didn't like in the Japanese version is when it's it's much like in um, what's the Godzilla raids again, um, yeah. where they're trying to bury him in the ice. Oh, oh my! Okay, and they're, I know they're what you're going to say. The ice <laughs> in in you know Godzilla raids again, aka Gigantus, right? Um, they're shooting the ice and this explosion sound is like bang, bang, bang. The same identical explosion sound is heard over and over and what over. What I really liked about it was how when they wanted to play back to back, it's like that cuts off the previous one. So there's yes. obviously one sound effect track and it's like, well, we've only got this one, so we want to layer this up, but we can't layer it. So we're just going to cut off the, before it's even finished playing the full sound, we'll play the next one. And it's the same sound again exactly and then you get into rodan and they have to like blow up the volcano at the end and they play firstly what is the same sound effect over and over and over and they're also like filming the same explosion from like three or four different angles so you're seeing like sometimes the same explosion from like a marginally different angle like 10 degrees to the left or the right it's not even like with a like, different with like Rodan's yeah. face poking out every now and then, then going back. Yeah. And out, the same bang, bang, bang. And I wouldn't be surprised. I almost went back to check and then I didn't. But like, is it the same explosion sound effect as we heard at nauseum in the other <laughs> movie? Because I wouldn't be surprised if it was. Because <laughs> why would is. you Yeah, why would you reuse it so much in one film and then come to another movie and you're like, Oh, we've got a different one now? It's like, no, I bet they've just got one really decent to be fair, explosion sound effect, and they're just like, well, we'll just use that over and over and over. And mm. the budget is such that, like, they haven't got another explosion. Or, I mean, I guess, like, back in this era, would they have to ha- actually explode something to get the sound? I don't know. Um, what you I know, guess so. Like, if you're filming, like, uh, like, what is it? They blow up this, like, the sides of cliffs and stuff at quarries to, like, mm. yeah, stuff like that. I guess you just take a dictaphone or whatever across, record it, and that's 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 your sound effect. That was the component that was missing. And you would think that after Godzilla raids again, they would be like, next time we do a big explosion sequence, <laughs> we need a few more explosion sounds. Because um, it also goes on a long time at the yeah, end. So know, this it, was my, honestly, my only criticism of the film was that final scene that you're talking about where they're blowing up the side of the mountain forever. It goes on a s- of how many times we hear the same sound. You're going to look forward to my quiz. Oh, I guess yeah. I guess. <laughs> um yeah man it goes on and on and it It feels longer when they're using that same sound over and over and like that was uh, the the last time i watched it before recording this i no i turned it off (laughs) no i turned off the film i was like i I know what (laughs) happens now so okay it was it just goes on for so long it's way way too long um, yeah, it is. I, I didn't see how long like it was four for. Four or five explosions, and that would be enough. Yeah, absolutely. But it's more like, I mean, I'll guess later, but guess it's later. a lot more than five or six. Yeah. And it, a yeah, lot more. I don't know how long it went on for, but it was long. I, yep. I, didn't, I didn't actually time it. Um, yeah, who knows? Probably went on for almost as long as we've complained about it for. <laughs> Probably. <laughs> um, oh, this is completely unrelated to kind of anything we've been talking about, but did you notice. Um, that uh you know the the couple that were taking like wedding pictures oh yeah on the, the volcano in, on the volcano all, all the charm of a quarry really why are you taking pictures there 
for a start. Yes, that's like, a good point. Actually, I didn't think of that. Like, why is this such a sought after location? Utterly surreal. Um, and also, when the woman was screaming because she saw Rodan, mm. very weak scream there. Yeah, not a scream queen. Uh, I know we say, like, we want women to get more to do in these movies, but <laughs> if you are there and your only job is to scream, like, give us a good give belt. Us a good, like, yeah. It's a real, like, ah, like, come on, like, scream a bit. <laughs> It's very strange. It's really not you know, not in the moment sort of scream. Yeah. Um, but yeah, on my last watch, um, there was something I noticed. So I thought uh, like they, they died, you know, because they, they, yeah. the shockwave from Rodan killed them. They get sort of, uh, I guess they hit the ground so hard they die yeah. sort of thing. I thought that was quite a harrowing death. Mm. Um, and then I thought the, the authorities found the bodies. And they were like, oh, trying to figure out what happened to them. But... They didn't find the bodies. Did you know where oh. they? Did you see where they ended up? No, I don't remember. Uh, they said, "Oh, the camera and the shoe were not near them." Yes, was a point of contention. Yeah, so basically, because all... they were saying, "Oh, is it a suicide pact?" Was one of the theories mm-hmm. right in the movie. Yep. Um, so, so it bas- wasn't, obviously, basically, all they found was a shoe. That was it. Oh, okay. Because the their remains were in Rodan's den, oh, like where okay. it's holed up. So, like, because you see a shot, it lasts maybe a second, if that. Like you see some some bones, and you see mm. one of the shoes right next to the bones, oh, and then it cuts as soon as you see the shoe. So like, yeah, Rodan right. ate them basically. Which... The, the um the the injuries at the start are quite gory as well. When the miners are first getting pulled out of the flooded mine, and yeah. they're all, like bloodied up. They're pretty um, they, you know, they're they're much more graphic than I'm used to from the other kaiju movies when it comes yep. to injuries. People usually just like get a bit of really sort of tomato ketchupy yeah. kind of blood on them yeah but uh in this one it's much more kind of realistic and i guess they want you to wonder like what what has done this yeah and like the the pilot's helmet covered in blood as well and Mm. when they find that and um when the jeeps crash and stuff you see like ragdoll bodies flying about and quite 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 brutal um but uh yeah i i think that's um going back to the volcano thing with the couple i think they assumed it was suicide because i can't remember when it was I think the early 1900s, there was a a woman in Japan that committed suicide by jumping into a volcano. Mm. So I think that was why they assumed that's what happened. Because it seems like such a bold assumption to be like, oh, well, you know, probably suicide. But then oh, why would one shoe be separate? It seems weird to jump to that conclusion of suicide. Um, but I think that might be why. Um, sorry. Yeah. Going back to the, uh, the US version quickly. Mm. So there's only really one other thing to mention. It's like, yeah, they made the romance more overt and tacky. As, yeah, 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 you know, standard. Uh, yeah, standard exactly. But it made me think how there's never been any kind of UK or Europe release of Rodan ever. Mm. Not in uh, theaters, not in like a DVD, a VHS, Blu-ray, nothing. Wow. Uh, yeah, absolutely nothing. And it just seems annoying. <laughs> I was going to say, it just seems crazy, but no, it's just annoying. I find that so frustrating. I, I really, really irks me when we don't get this stuff in the UK and I don't know why. I like, think we'd have like a Blu-ray of it by now. Or a DVD or something. Yeah. Like, and, unless you import it and have a region-free player, you're not going to see this. Mm. You know, it's just, um, yeah, frustrating. It's frustrating. So if anyone's listening that has any influence on this, please do something about it because it's so annoying. Um, yeah, we got Mothra, so it would stand to reason. I mean, I guess Mothra's mm. more marketable than, than Rodan. I guess so, yeah. I, I think you know, like the time has passed for Rodan, I guess. You know, it's not that big of a character, like what you're saying, you know. No. You've got your main characters, and Rodan's not really one of them. Mm. So, yeah, that's my 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 thoughts on that. Um, so, did you have a favourite moment of this movie? Favourite bit? Um, I did really like the part where the Naganulon first came into the house and mm. it was like I what I liked about it was that I was um cautiously aware that we might spend a long time sort of not seeing anything or, you know, they would drag out <laughs> yeah. the um would be murder mystery without really doing much. And, you know, there there are other things they could have done, you know, but I like that we got right to it. Well, like, oh no, here's the creature. Um it basically clears Goro's name and, you know, 
uh, we can mm. move past that aspersion. So I like that because it was an exciting scene and it meant the movie was like moving forward. And I like that. I like the bit where they also chased the Mega Newland up the mountain yep. um, near the mining you know, facility. And the thing that I liked actually most of all in the whole movie, and I really appreciated this, was that so much of it was filmed on real locations out in like Japanese countryside yes. or Japanese places not on sets. And I didn't really realize this when we talked about Mothra versus Godzilla, but that was majoratively like huge amounts of it were just filmed indoors on sets and things. Um, I, think I think actually that, all of it was even the outdoor shots or when they were outside in like the wooded area where they saw the Shobujin. I think that that was a set as well because you see like a, a miniature building. Yeah, there's a bit where they they're like, I don't know about the when they saw the big egg. Was it like on an actual beach or in a set? I don't really know. Oh, I what think was that, that was a beach. Yeah. But this is the thing where it's like yeah. there's so much of Rodan though where it's like they are in you can see real hills, real mountains, real backdrops. So mm. everybody's just like, oh, this is nice. Like it gave the movie like a very sort of tangible, um, sort of authentic quality to yes. it. And yeah, the effects are a little bit ropey. Um, even compared to Mothra and Godzilla, they're not quite at the same standard. Mm. Um, but that um, kind of realism and the choice to film on real locations gave it a nice sense of like reality that was otherwise missing from other elements of the film. So it sort of made up for it. Yeah. So it wasn't a moment as such, but that was the thing that I was like, I really appreciate this. Yeah. Um, that's, they've that's, gone to the effort. That's a, that's a good point actually. Yeah. Cause I, there was a sh- shot I noticed when they, um, when Shigeru first met up with Kyo after they found uh, Yoshi and it was just a shot outside and the way the uh, camera is angled, you could see the sky behind them. And mm-hmm. I really liked how I think they just had a fill light on the actors so that the they were exposed correctly with the sky. And you got a whole, it was like, yeah, they're outdoors on a sunny day. And it felt, yeah, like you say, tangible. It was like, they're actually there. And it was such a different feeling to the other movies where they're almost never outside on location. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, uh- I mean, there are a few sets in Rodan where it like cuts to like a newsroom where there's like there's it's a newspaper group, you know, new, 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 newspaper journalist, mm-hmm. and the set is very reminiscent of the sets that we've seen in Mothra and uh, Mothra versus Godzilla, and you have to imagine that by the time they get to those later movies, um, this being the earlier one, that they are just like reusing bits and pieces of those things, and that's why it looks similar. Mm-hmm. So there was a moment of me being like, oh, like that could literally be the same bit of plywood with a window put in it that I've seen <laughs> numerous times before. But yeah. majoritively, um, yeah, when they're outdoors, they're really, really outdoors and the indoor sets are a bit more sort of robust as well. Yeah, um, even like when they were in the in the town at night when, mm. um, it was it, um, Yoshi's wife, Atami, she was like going to go Trying yell to at on the door and Yeah, all that. I think that yeah. was a set, but it was... It was really well done. It looked like an, an old an old town, and it was quite quite large. Yeah, I didn't second guess it as a real street. Mm. I mean, it probably wouldn't have been. I don't know. Um, so yeah, it's very um, nice sort of production values on this. Totally, totally agree. Absolutely. What about your favorite moments? The city destruction scene. Oh yeah, it was, was just uh, maybe that's quite an easy obvious one, but it was it was so good. And like I say, I managed to suspend my disbelief seeing this guy flying mm. around on piano string because I was so just you know blown away by it it was it was so good and the destruction was just unrelenting and just yeah seeing everything being <laughs> blown to pieces rolling around and yeah stuff and, everything yeah. just like absolutely on point that's what you want in a city destruction scene uh really enjoyed it it's nice when you get one and you also sort of care about the narrative and this is what we kind of complained about in the previous movie is that there was a lot of action but it does sort of just take place in kind of like a bit of a wasteland sort of countryside area for Godzilla and Mothra to fight in. Yeah. Whereas with Rodan, it's not a versus fight scene, but the destruction itself feels like it's you know an important part of the story and it looks really, really good. Yeah. yeah. Um, so just a couple of little subtleties in the sort of um, the story really help those scenes feel a bit more than like a guy in a suit, you know, splashing off a cardboard box. Yeah. Um, <laughs> it makes all the difference. <laughs> yeah, it really does. Yeah. Um, it also included my least favorite moment was an advertising oh. for this drink called Calpis, which sounds like Calpis. Um, I think I might have spotted that. Yeah, it's like a put it out of my mind. It's a caricature of a black person drinking. A oh drink. yes, I did see it. Yes, and uh, yes, it crossed my mind. <sighs> yeah, um, I was just like, oh, you had this amazing scene, and that popped up. I was just a bit like, I think it's um because you also see an Asahi beer sign, mm. and Asahi owns that that drink as well calpis 
So, got paid for this movie. Somehow, yeah, so I, I think it was right. like a sponsoring kind of thing, product placement. Mm. Um, but I looked it up. I was like, surely they don't still use that logo. Uh, yeah, they do. No, they don't. So <laughs> okay. in, in 1990, they they dropped it because there was a um, a complaint from this 12 year old Japanese kid who was part of the association to stop racism. Oh, yeah. uh, and they were like, this isn't on. Stop. So they they dropped it. Fair enough. Yeah. So that that's good. So you know, there's a, there's a good outcome for this. But Rodan yeah. destroys the sign. You <laughs> see, <laughs> no, actually, in no. The, movie. the tanks do. Well, they destroy it. It gets destroyed. Yes, so. we're happy. <laughs> yeah. Um, Eventually, we'll get to an era of, of movies where we don't have, to have any of that. We'll, we'll crawl our way out of show era. I into like I feel like each film, I'm like waiting for something waiting offensive for to happen. Like, oh God, what's it going to be this time? Uh, it's just a fleeting reminder of you know. The social issues of the era the movie's from. Yeah. It's, yeah. So, yeah. There you it's go. It's unfortunate. It's not quite the painted face thing. <laughs> um, yeah. Thank God. Okay. Right. Quiz time. Oh. So, five questions for you this time. Okay. So, uh, I have to, I, you know, you just look at me getting two out of four. Yeah, exactly. So, I want you to get two out of five this time. Okay. <laughs> okay. So, question one. What is Rodan's actual name in the original Japanese 1956 release? Is ah. it is it A. Rodon, B. Raydan, or C. Radon? Hmm. Well, Radon. Yes, correct. Okay. I didn't think you'd get that. What made Just you say that? Just guessing out of those. Well, the Don. Part of it uh, being at the at the end of the word feels to me like that probably you know is relating to the lizard element of things and like they use Don in other creature names so I think that must re- refer to like a dinosaur or something. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, you're, you're, uh, that is exactly it because it's a contraction of um, Tyrannodon. So why did they change it around for the West with Rodan? Because when Stupid. you when you look at it spelled, it, it's yeah. it's spelled the same as the word radon, which is a radioactive gas which is emitted from the earth so he'd be like oh why is there a movie about gas that's I why i guess so i don't know that's that that, yeah. that's that is 100% why because like w- I, when i, I, I saw I, that i was I, like why? I buy that it's why but yeah. i just don't care that they i think that's they, <laughs> they should have just like not cared about that i suppose but i mean it's stuck even in japan so it's still he's mm. called rodon Rod- oh, I said it wrong he's called rodan now so I, I like the name i like the name rodan so it just sounds like it's kind of like almost humanistic, the Rodan part of it. It's like, mm. a bit, yeah, I don't know. yeah, fair enough. So, yeah, c- congrats, got that one. Okay, now, question two How many times do we hear the exact same explosion sound during the volcano missile attack scene? Mm, I so wish I had counted. <laughs> I was going multiple I, choice. Oh, yeah, it's multiple choice, but actually, I want to hear your guess before I give you the choices anyway. Okay. Hmm. I'm going to say it's about. I don't want to overestimate, and because it could probably be less than I think, even though it sounds like loads and loads and loads. So I'm going to say twenty-eight. <laughs> is this like stupidly low, or this is low? Okay. Oh dear. So is it A fifty-six, <laughs> okay. B sixty-seven, or C seventy-eight? It's probably seventy-eight. <laughs> It's 67. Right. But... In, in my brain, I was like, oh, it's probably about 35. And I was like, no, probably more like 25. <laughs> so I sort of evened it out a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> There's one of the explosions is very slightly obscured by the sound of a Jeep going by. So it might be 66. So Well, I didn't but, get it right either way. But in any case, him, yeah. so. for anyone who did sit there and count, I just want to, you know, just put that out there okay, in case they yeah. argue with me. It um, feels like 78. Oh, Absolutely. Well, the thing is, there are actually more instances of that sound used in the film. Just not in that. Just not in that scene. So I think the actual total count is 70. Oh, I think. uh, Around about there. So, yeah, it's... it's, it's, We're in the 70s anyway, so... Okay. Yes. Um, Okay, and I'm going to play that sound now for everyone to listen to. Uh, Play it a couple of times. Yeah. (laughs) 67 times. (laughs) Okay, question three. What is Rodan's wingspan in this movie? 
Is it mm. A, 270 feet, B, 553 feet, or C, 871 feet? I'm not good at this kind of thing. I'm going to say the 501. Incorrect. It was 270 feet in this movie. But in some scenes, it was bigger. Well, yeah, when you look at the Mega Nulon, this was clearly mm. way bigger. Um, so, yeah, this is the smallest incarnation of Rodan. And the 871 feet is the size of the Monsterverse Rodan. Oh, I get you. Yeah, 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 yeah. He's a lot bigger in that. A lot bigger. What a great scene. Yeah, really good. That, that scene is so good, yeah. It's a shame there wasn't more. Oh well. Okay, so, question four. When do we hear this music? Okay, I think I know. Okay. I think I know it. Yeah. Okay, so is it A, during the news broadcast segments across Asia? Mm-hmm. B, when the JASDF squadron chase Rodan? Or C, when we see the second Rodan? I believe it's B, because when the Japanese self-defense force, whatever they're called, come on, I felt like, this music's okay, but it's not the theme, you know, the one. Oh, because that's, well, you're correct, that is the one, yes, so yes, well done, correct. <laughs> Hmm. But so, I, this is uh, yeah, basi- I mean, isn't this I, basically Rodan's theme now? But I mean, it's not the because the the theme that we now associate with Godzilla is, is the military. Exactly. March. So that's what yeah. I was missing. I was oh yeah, this is where they normally play that music, and I sort of felt the absence of it. So mm. that's what I mean. Mm. Uh, so yeah, correct. Well done. Mm. I'm now, up to two, I think. You are up to two. Yes. So <laughs> let's see if we can get past two with the final question. Question five. How much did the Rodan suit weigh? Was it 100 pounds, 125 pounds, or mm. 150 pounds? Quite light by the sounds of things. And all of these measurements, I always thought it would be really heavy. That's heavy. Guess, They're all heavy. I guess it is when you put it on. Yeah. Uh, I'll say uh, 125. Incorrect. Oh. It's 150. So that's like, yeah. that's like over 10 stone. Yeah, I just... Yeah, heavy. Heavy. Very heavy. Um, So how did you do? You got... Two Two. out of five. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Always two. (laughs) Never mind. Never mind. No, good job. I'm proud of you. Okay. So, overall, I loved this movie. Yeah, I can tell. Yeah, man. Absolutely loved it. Um... Like I said, yeah, I like the way the plot builds and how everything gets progressively more dramatic. Um, I think it has some of the best visual effects, also coupled with some of the worst. But like, yeah, like I said, it didn't matter. Uh, it didn't affect anything I was seeing. Um, yeah, the characters weren't stellar, but, you know, they moved everything along and they weren't intrusive or weighing down the plot. So that's a thumbs up there mm. um like if anything you kind of touched on a bit it's like we could have actually built on some of that a bit more some of their you know the the dynamics between them um but then you run the risk of you know outstaying its welcome or it just being about those people um so i th- i think it struck the right balance there um yeah some of the more emotional parts really landed with me uh like between kyo and shigeru and then the final scene with rodan with the really excellent music um, just the only thing is I, I wish that volcano, that volcano missile scene was shorter I think if yeah. if that if that was shorter this would be basically perfect to me like this well, is is that why the American one's 10 minutes shorter no it's still a really long scene in fact I think it might be longer because they double up some of the shots of Rodan poking its head out the cave and mirror it to make it look like it's two Rodans <sighs> I, I don't know it, just, it still felt like it went on forever um, so that's not why it's shorter they just lift it out other bits for pacing um but yeah this is uh this is one of my favorite films that we've seen i mm. i love this film i really do um great great film what about you i don't think i loved it quite as much as you mm. but i would say it's it's probably the equal of Mothra in terms of like the overall quality of the film um story is really good you know it's, you know 
tethers you along nicely. You get some nice reveals. There's more than one creature. Um, they put some effort into this, like you know, the initial um, potential murder plot, where like, oh, is somebody you know taking the opportunity to use the cave-in as a cover for murder is interesting, and then it you know as a, that reveals to be a monster thing. It's like you could you could picture that story just being its own movie. Mm. And I like when that sort of thing, you know, sort of real sort of um, conundrums coincide with the monster stuff. So it feels like a very sort of grounded film, despite the effects being a bit wonky. Um, it does feel a bit dated, as I talked about before. But um, yeah, it holds up and it's worth a watch. It's a good one. Yeah. And it's not too long as well, which is also nice. I like a short film. Okay, so Kaiju Corner. Graham, what is this segment of the show? This is where we talk about Godzilla and uh, all kaiju sort of cultural footprints outside of the, the kaiju movies that we talk about. So it's, it's sort of extracurricular. What other things have been going on with kaijus over the last 70 years? So we've each brought one to the table today. Uh, both sort of related in a way. Mm. Um, so one that I saw recently uh, so Alex Rushdie the director of Dawn of the Monsters which we've talked about on previous episodes and I've spoken to him as well he retweeted out a commercial for OPG which is the Ontario Power Generation Company uh, um, he yeah, retweeted out this commercial it's like 15 seconds long um, and it's about how nuclear power has been vilified by pop culture Mm -hmm. so it's only 15 seconds long but in the opening portion of of in the opening portion of the commercial there's a scene with a totally not godzilla kaiju terrorizing Mm -hmm. this city i mean it couldn't look more like godzilla if it tried frankly i I wouldn't be surprised if toho pipe pipe up and say by the way stop that to be honest yeah because godzilla is not public domain the way king kong is no and And like it's not an authorized use then it's not a collaboration of any kind no it's not because it really looks like it could be it really does i think Mm. because the way his body lights up looks different enough and it's not and it's not the same screen is it yeah Yeah, exactly exactly Mm. um so yeah this this kaiju that's obviously godzilla is terrorizing the city and it's about how it's time to flip the script of nuclear energy as a safe energy source Mm. um just to be clear alex wasn't tweeting this out in support he was just like what on earth is this kind of thing you know um so yeah basically it's spin for nuclear energy now what doesn't sit right with me with this is even taking into account nuclear energy's benefits and safety measures and stuff like that what the ad does is it diminishes real life events by pretending it's only pop culture that's given nuclear energy a bad rap that's correct Uh, and so it's like what about chernobyl what about three mile island what about fukushima like Mm. these weren't pop culture events these were (laughs) these were catastrophes of the highest magnitude so like to paint it like godzilla walking around destroying a city is giving nuclear energy a bad rap is disingenuous to say the least and because who really goes to godzilla movies these days thinking about nuclear power plants anyway yeah exactly it's absurd it's (laughs) it's absurd um (laughs) I, I find it pretty appalling that an energy company of all is playing the victim. Like, it's, mm. it's pretty disgusting, to be honest. For I mean, multiple reasons. Yeah. You know, not limited to any potential criticism of nuclear energy itself, which I don't know about you, like, I'm, I'm kind of indifferent towards nuclear energy as a thing. I'm, I'm the same. It's, sorry, go on. No, just that, you know, there are other reasons, like, that I wouldn't be weeping for an energy company other than, you know, <laughs> the actual source of the energy itself. I mean, yeah. nuclear energy has its, you know, like say it's famous disasters but there's also obviously countless uh, nuclear plants out there which are just doing fine yeah um, that's- so you, that's a separate kind of argument but to to harness the the allegorical kind of nuclear bomb creature for that is really kind of gross and short-sighted like i completely yeah it, it's it's slimy Especially when you consider that Shin Godzilla is very much sort of the re-inspiration from the <laughs> Fukushima disaster, and it's like exactly, yeah, it's yeah. really kind of gross. And I wouldn't be surprised if a lot of lawyers were talking about it. It's not even an energy company that you've really heard of. Yeah, it's a government-owned company in well Ontario in Canada. So it's like, yeah, yeah. it's um, yeah. I'm the same as you. I'm not necessarily for or against nuclear energy because I don't know enough about it. I don't know about its waste management and its safety. Like, yeah, there's tons operating 
without issue but you know there were some that weren't so i think it's okay to be skeptical about it but to act hard done by especially when it's a bunch of fat cats probably sitting on a pile of money whinging go fuck yourself honestly yeah i found that just appalling it's really the bad godzilla movies are not the reason people don't like nuclear power at any cost at any rate you know no no it's, fucking stupid. it's ridiculous like maybe it's fair to reevaluate nuclear um but just to act like it's movies that's given it a poor image is it's bad form um, yeah, and it just yeah, like you say with like Shin Godzilla, you know, it just ignores the fact that it was inspired by inspired by um, real life events. I doubt they've even bothered to research it that deeply yeah. to, to even realize like that 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 connection exists and like artistically, this is insulting because of what Godzilla means as a character. And what's weird was in that commercial, like the only two things that are in it was one was Godzilla and the other one was just a guy in a hoodie, mm. and like it's like. Wait, what's that a reference to? Like, is, is slim pickings for um, <laughs> people criticizing nuclear power in pop culture? Like, yes, it happens, but not as often as they're acting like it is. Well, maybe so. the Canadian government thinks it's okay to um, infringe on Japanese IP, but not like, you know, The Incredible Hulk, where they might actually <laughs> worry about Disney really coming after them. <laughs> they maybe not have, you know, credited Toho with enough sort of, um, you know, yeah legal energy to do something about it but i'm sure if they 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 want to they will yeah and to act act like godzilla was the result of a nuclear plant nuclear power plant blowing up is also bollocks like it was an atom bomb you know what what the fuck i I don't know i don't know what they're what they're going at with this and it seems like it's okay to open up a discussion about it but to act hard done by nah not cool well, if you want to have a serious new discussion about nuclear energy, you need to do it in a way that's a bit more intelligent than that. Completely. And just going after like these sort of like, you know, this somewhat satirical sort of like, oh, we're going to make fun of this a little bit so we can address it. It's just like, it's not very funny. It's not funny. Yeah, it wasn't funny at all. <laughs> so, so, yeah, it's a, for a few reasons. swing and a miss there from OPG. Mm. Um, so that's me at my soapbox about that. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I haven't got anything more to say about it. But if you get, get on YouTube or wherever, just type in OPG Godzilla commercial, you, you'll see it somewhere listed in articles. Yeah. Um, Assuming it's still going to be used, I wouldn't be surprised if they pulled it if there was a legal problem. I mean, it's so we'll so, see. It's, it, it really does step on Godzilla's toes mm. there so much that like, there's no there's no mistaking. Because I when I saw it, I thought, oh, this they've actually used Godzilla. It looks that much like him. That's so. what I thought. I mean, we, we can't really presume that Toho wouldn't be up for this because we don't know. But what we can say mm. is that there, there's a, at the very least, even without any cultural or social issues, you know, notwithstanding, that they are infringing on copyright pretty heavily here. So yeah. the whole thing is just really cr- crappy and lame. Yep, completely. Um, so yeah, that's mine. Now I'm nice and heated about that. Uh, mm. <laughs> what's yours? <laughs> Well, the theme today with Kaiju Corner would be Godzilla and advertising, I suppose, mm-hmm. which there are probably like many, many examples of this that we will re- re- revisit in the future. Um, but probably, at least in my opinion, I don't know about you, because I guess maybe you've not heard of this even, but the most famous use of Godzilla in advertising in an official capacity is the 1992 Nike shoe commercial Godzilla vs. Charles Barkley. Right. Tell me. Yeah. What's happening? It's a, it's a good ad. Well, it's so, a good ad. I mean, there's not really like any sort of mythos to the creation of this commercial as such, but, um, you know, Nike were, were making a shoe deal with Charles Barkley and they wanted to do an ad. And I guess because they wanted to show like how big their star was, they thought, oh, well, it would be fun to just do this with Godzilla. It's just like an idea. Um, for people who aren't aware, Charles Barkley was the star player for the Phoenix Suns back in the 90s. And they never won a championship like a lot of teams in the 90s because of Chicago Bulls related reasons. But People will know Charles Barkley, whether they're into basketball or not, if they've seen Space Jam, because he is, other than Michael Jordan, he's the primary athlete who acts in the in the film. Um, so Charles Barkley is pretty famous, and he still works as a sports pundit now. He's a known kind of guy. Um, so they had this idea for Nike to do this ad with Godzilla, and Toho sanctioned it, said, yeah, you can do that. And all these special effects were done by ILM. So they made the Godzilla suit, and they used their sort of... Um, puppet technology is similar to like what how you do with like the gremlins and stuff so all of the eyes and the mouth are sort of controlled by servos so it actually blinks and sort of expresses a little bit as well as having like a guy in there i think and who are ilm ilm is the uh 
that's Industrial Light and Magic, which is a very famous special effects house mm. in America, and they made their name on Star Wars, and then they've done like loads and loads of movies, you know, like Terminator and Jurassic Park. That's ILM. Yeah. Um, so if you've been watching any '90s movies like that, this is right in that era of like the peak of their powers. Um, and the city that they used to stage this like quick 30 second basketball showdown between Charles Barkley and Godzilla was the same set they used for Ghostbusters 2, which oh. it has a sequence which is its own kaiju corner, you might say, where the Statue of Liberty becomes like somewhat sentient and is controlled by the Ghostbusters walking around New York City. Oh, I mean, right. that's, like, that's a Godzilla thing, right? Isn't yeah, it? yeah. So they took those miniatures from that sequence. I've never actually seen Ghostbusters 2 all the way through, you know. Haven't you? Um, Have you seen that no, scene? I've, you know, I've got a bit of osmosis about okay. that. I was going to say, did you recognise the sets or anything? Or the miniatures? I didn't until I read the, the facts. Because mm. they've made it look like Tokyo. They put, like, you know, Japanese signs and things up. Yeah. So yeah, the ad is pretty straightforward. It's very, very short. Um, you know, Charles Barkley happened upon... Godzilla smashing up Tokyo, but Charles Barkley is, for whatever reason, the same scale as Godzilla. <laughs> so they have a basketball showdown. Charles Barkley wins because he's got the shoes, the, ni- the oh. Nike shoes, which are, today I was trying to find the name of the shoes. What particular shoe Does is it? Does it not say not- in the ad? I don't think so. Oh my God, let's um, watch it. I mean, yeah. you, you just watched it, so... Yeah, I did, but- <laughs> You know me, like I can't take it in the first time. The first time round, it doesn't. So. No, it's not like uh, it's obviously like, like not an Air Jordan. Let's see. I don't. I mean, there must be like some. There's a shot of like the side of the shoe, mm. and like you know what I know about shoes, you could fit on a grain of rice. I, it could be any shoe. You could tell me anything. I'll be like, yeah, that must be that shoe. Well, it's the shoe is itself Charles Barkley affiliated. It's his shoe, but as far as I can tell, it's not called like the Barkley or anything, where it's just easy to. <laughs> To Google, so I've looked up like Charles Barkley Nike, and I've looked at all these photographs of Charles Barkley and the Nikes that he wore at that era. And but I don't know, I don't so know what the shoe is. I guess it was just Nike advertising it's in just general. Nike general, yeah, yeah. Just general Nike. I guess that means they can just play it like at nauseum, like as much as they want. Yeah, true. You um, can play it. You could play it today. Yes, you probably could. Why not? Yeah. Um, so yeah, Barkley beats Godzilla, and at the end he says. Um, to console Godzilla, he says the Lakers are looking for a big man, which might be alluding to the fact that Magic Johnson had recently retired and left the Lakers, and I guess they would be looking for a guy. It might be a joke about ah, like that. Sports jokes. In the Japanese version, where the NBA, I guess, is, was not as popular um, in, in Japan at the time, he says to Godzilla, have you ever thought about wearing shoes? So it's a different joke, because they have might Have you ever sh- thought about wearing shoes? That's what he says. Yeah, maybe that one would land better with me because I know nothing about sports. So, <laughs> well, I guess it's for a sports fan. Audience, yeah, yeah. It? So, I mean, all the information I'm getting for this is on Wikipedia. If people want to look at it in more detail, mm. um, but yeah, it's just a nice ad. It's, a uh, it's nicer than the one that you talked about. Um, <laughs> yeah, it's very funny. The effects are like literally cinema movie quality because they've got a real effects studio to do it. They've yep. got the big name. Um, Charles Barkley was in a lot of commercials back then. Like I say, he's he's done a, a tiny bit of acting. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, the it's yeah. good. It's good. Can't imagine how much that cost to make. Oof. I imagine I mean, a lot of money. If like, you assume that Charles Barkley's fee was probably tied into the shoe deal, they probably didn't pay him specifically for the ad, but the effects alone probably cost about yeah ten million dollars. Yeah, it's yeah. A, it's, no, it's a good ad. I like it. Ah, it's an extra bit. It's an extra bit. Yes, there's even more to this kaiju corner that I oh, forgot to add. Oh, here we go. The ad, the ad was so popular that they adapted the advert into a full-length one-off Dark Horse comic book called Godzilla vs. Charles Barkley. I have not actually <laughs> found it anywhere where you can buy a reissue. I've seen it on eBay for uh, some money. Right. Um, but this pa- panels from that comic have become sort of memeified. Mm. And I sent you one today where it's like Godzilla's like slam dunking. And he's wearing the shoes. Exactly, he's wearing like Nike branded shoes, so and it says Godzilla got busy, which is a sportsman's colloquialism for Godzilla put in some practice time. And um, <laughs> yeah, so it had some legs, you know, this whole like thing, and it, it, it goes back way back to the unproduced movie like Godzilla versus Frankenstein, right? Like this was always mm. fun to see Godzilla versus something absurd. Yeah, yeah. And I think it must have directly inspired. We're getting into more, you know, advertising basketball stuff now, but um, there was a. Michael, jo- Michael Jordan versus Bugs Bunny commercial that came a few years later and that's where they got the idea to do Space Jam from. 
Um, oh right! So I'm sure if they hadn't made Godzilla versus Charles Barkley, they wouldn't they wouldn't be a Space Jam. And it's a shame that Godzilla was at this point in '92. There was not there had never been a, an American produced Godzilla movie. But really, like who knows? Like mm. in another era, I mean, in the '80s, there might... been an American recut with some new scenes for the Return in '84. Oh, right, yeah, yeah. I think it but was. It was something like you know, like, like Godzilla '98 sort of thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that this is that this is before all that. But maybe in another time, we would have got Godzilla versus Charles Barkley, the full length feature, instead of or as well as yeah. Space Jam. You know, imagine that. But yeah, it's fun commercial. It's fun to imagine. Maybe I mean, if they did a full length movie, it would probably suck. But, um, <laughs> I have no idea what the comic book is like, and if we ever get our hands on it, I mean, it's probably available somewhere online. You know, mm. variously, you could probably read it. Um, but that could probably be its own little mini discussion. I'll see. We love the yeah. Godzilla comic books. I'll see if I can find it. Uh, yeah. that's cool I wonder if um, I don't know when they when we spoke on the last one we spoke about the Simon Says um, mm. sample being used in basketball like which came first was the use of that in basketball first or uh. did um, this commercial come around first because I'm wondering if they're like oh well you know Godzilla and basketball they're now like a thing let's use this Godzilla tune you know is there some parallel there I'm just quickly googling isn't Simon Says like a somewhat recent song no ah, okay because uh, the Simon Says song by Pharaoh Monk came out in 99. Yeah. So the song may have been inspired by the commercial, maybe. But, I, well, oh, I don't think the song as such, but as in like its use within basketball. Yeah, they might have like been like, oh, yeah, I, yeah, I don't know. Maybe. Mm. Maybe. There's uh, just osmosis, perhaps. But yeah, yeah there's just sort of a through line there, sort of being created in the early 90s. Yeah, obvi- oh, you're right. Obviously, the song would not have been inspired by the shoe commercial to then be played at a basketball game. That's right. But um, yeah. Maybe there's something that links it all together. There's a yeah, the weird, weird link between basketball and Godzilla. Your two faves. I'll, I'll try not to have another basketball-related uh, kaiju corner next. Time. Yeah, I'm done with the sports talk now. But, <laughs> yeah, if it happens, I I don't, I don't control culture. You know. <laughs> culture is what it is. No, um, it's fine. It's fine. Uh, you just you just have to explain it to me because I obviously have no clue. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, that's a cool one. I yeah, I really like that ad. Mm. Um, yeah, much better than mine. I'm gonna see if I can find something a bit chirpier for the next one. <laughs> um, okay, so how do people speak to us, Graham, if they want to talk to us? Go on social media and search for Monster Island Radio on wherever you want to talk to us. Anywhere's fine. We'll pick up the phone. <laughs> Not literally, but you know, figuratively speaking, the phone will be answered. <laughs> and uh, we uh, we welcome all feedback and opinions. We want to know how your your thoughts on this movie differ from our own. Whether we made any little, you know, mistakes, we can, you know, submit corrections, obviously. Or if you just think it's such a great podcast, you want to let us know. We'd, we'd like to hear that as well. Yeah. Exactly. So you, I think if you search Monster Style and Radio, or Monster Island, it's going to come up on Instagram, um, Facebook. I believe I've got a Facebook account. No, no Just Facebook. have a look. You, you have a look. Can you tell us if we're on Facebook or not? <laughs> I don't know. Monster Island Radio. That's what you want to do. So let's search for it. Yes, and you will find us. Perfect. Yeah. Okay, cool. So I guess until the next episode, bye-bye. Bye.